I just wanted to welcome everybody to the SE Economics Fall webinar series. Tonight is on um, types of financial institutions and will be led by Denise Harrell. So thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I'm Cassidy Stiglebauer, even though it says Amanda. Um, but if you have any questions, feel free to put them up in the chat um, and I'll, I'll flag Denise down. And um, with that, feel free to go ahead, Denise. Hi, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Denise Harrell. I'm one of the first cohorts of the SCE Master Financial Literacy Teachers. So I'm working on my second year, Silver. Um, I also work at the Bose Mill School here in DD2 down in Somerville. This is my second year teaching personal finance as a core, as you know, a straight elective, um, but I've always included it in as an extra, what we call exploratory piece. Um, the approach today is um, I'm attempting to go for a more simple approach that I learned from Relay that, and also I'm getting a lot of feedback from other coworkers that through the PDs, they're getting a lot of technology thrown at them and it's just a little disengaging for them when they're trying to get the content material of the PD. But I'm more than happy to tell you how you can change this into a Nearpod or an interactive Google Slides if needed. All right, are we ready? All right, so I'm gonna share my screen with you so I can get this presentation. Is it sharing my screen? Can everybody see it? We still see you. You still see me, all right. I am a Teams district. Let me get this going again. All right, how about now? Yes, Zoom is my friend tonight. <laughs> Again, we're going to go over financial institutions. I recently been over this with a group of students, um, and I switched it up a little bit from feedback from them and things that I've noticed that the curriculum is not exactly highlighting as a what, why, or where. Um, again, is it advancing? There we go. Welcome. Again, my name is Denise, and I'm so honored to be here to give y'all this presentation, and I hope you enjoy it, and it will be shared out with y'all. So the SC standard that we're going to cover follows under the portrait of SC graduate, and it is a social studies and economic standard. And I did include the standard if you need it for your future lesson plans. Um, instead of doing objectives, I do the what, the why, the how. Because of the fact, if you know your what, and your why, you understand the purpose of what you're learning. So we're exploring the various financial institutions to provide clarity and understanding of the different services offered in their roles. Why are we doing this? To understand the difference in purpose of banks and other financial institutions to help to decrease the percentage of unbanked and underbanked through education. We're gonna learn this through lecture, direct discussion, visuals, ed puzzles, and a cartoon analysis. And then I have some fun activities you can share with your students so that they can apply it. Our agenda today, introductions, we've already done that. The what, the why, the how. We're gonna go into first unbanking and then banking basics. The Federal Reserve, we're gonna to touch on that because I know there's been a lot of PDs about the Federal Reserve lately. There's a cartoon analysis at the end, and we're going to expand beyond that, and then you'll get some information about the South Carolina financial literacy. All right, so questions. And the way we're going to do this is you're going to add in the chat. So what does it mean to be unbanked or underbanked? And I'm trying to get the chat up, but it's not working for me. There we go. All right, y'all, I'm new to chat uh, to this, so at least to this one. All right, I'm having issues getting to the chat. Here we go. And again, sorry about the Zoom. All right, so we have not access. Some people don't know about underbanking. Don't use bank accounts. Unbanked means I keep away from my money under my mattress. <laughs> I love that one. Whether or not someone has a bank account based on their area. Ooh, Crystal's onto something. 
All right. So yes, unbanked or underbanked is when individuals do not have a bank or financial institution that they use. And underbanked is they may have a savings account, but that's it. All right, so voice discussion here, and we're gonna do some cold calls. I hope y'all are ready for them. Um, if I can get back to, all right, Casey, will you call on a couple of people like cold call for me? Cause I'm having issues with my, I, I don't know Zoom y'all, I'm so sorry. Um, what, yeah. other, what other services do these unbanked and underbanked individuals use as an alternative to banking? So our cold calls here, we need three. All right, so Cynthia Carlisle, um, Erica Edwards and Stephanie Wise. All right, so Cynthia Carlisle first. Oh, she says she doesn't have a microphone or camera, but um, okay, you can add it in the chat. She just said uh, payday loans. Yes, payday loans is a good one. What about Miss Edwards? I would say payday loans too. <laughs> All right. And our, our last individual? Who was the last one? Stephanie Wise. Okay. You can, if you want to just type it in the text box, feel free to do that as well. Well, Thurman Evans, oh, Stephanie said she's not sure, but Thurman Evans said money check cashing. Yes. All right. So some of the major ones that they use are check cashing, the payday loans, we got money orders. We also have those visa check cards that charge a fee every time you use them. And then we also have pawn shops. People use pawn shops as well. All right, what is the average cost per year in total that goes towards fees and interest associated with the unbanked individuals in America? And we're gonna take a couple of guesses here. So I want some volunteers on this one. So does anybody have a good guess? 15 to 25%, okay. Anybody else? Miss Edwards, 33. All right, so, ooh, chance is very, chance is getting closer. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is approximately $89 billion on average in fees and services that is paid out to these institutions. 63% um, of America's unbanked or underbanked. So, um, excuse me, that 63 million is unbanked or underbanked. So um, this is a lot of money coming out of people's pockets. My students recently watched Spent Looking for Change. One gentleman spent $40,000 in fees a year out of his own pocket because he was unbanked. That's a lot of money, y'all. And the reason why I want to highlight this is our students need to understand financial institutions so that they can go home and share it with their families who may be unbanked and also so that they don't become unbanked themselves. So they need to understand it. All right, so I'm going to move forward. All right, so can anybody we have somebody in the waiting room, let me get it. All right, here's some reasons why people are unbanked. They don't have enough money in their account. They avoid banking because they feel like it's a privacy or security issue because a lot of people use mobile banks, right? They don't trust banks. And also they don't understand the fees, right? So that's a huge issue. If they are, don't understand the fees, they're gonna run away from it. Because a lot of times you see where you have to have a basic amount in your account in order to not pay a fee, right? How fair is that? So in this interactive, 
And let me get this to work. And I like this right here because students can explore. So I'm opening up a hyperlink here. This is an interactive for you to use with your students or for your students to use where you can compare data to find out and start inferring and figuring out why certain areas have a higher percentage of unbanked or underbanked individuals. So when you do this, you can ask your students, what area do you think is the highest percentage? And we did by starting with South Carolina and we did a view. And what it does is it gives you the percentage. So in 2019, our unbanked or underbanked went down. And we can start discussing why that happens. Now, if you want to compare, let me go back. We're gonna to compare to a different area. Can someone give me another area to choose from either region or state? Does anybody, here we go. Let me go back to chat. North Carolina. And literacy does um, play into a factor as well. And also um, the region. So we said North Carolina, we'll go West. Uh, it looks like somebody said Appalachia. Appalachians, that's good. All right, so we're gonna do, What's another one? We'll stick with Alabama, why not? All right. So you can compare and trust how it looks. So here we have Alabama has a higher percentage than Western North Carolina. And we can talk about the education system. We can talk about how certain states do require personal finance now. So, uh, we can talk about literacy. There's a lot of conversations to be had here. Can anybody give me an idea of how they would use this compare and contrast in their class? How do you think you could use it? And if you want to speak out, you're more than welcome to speak out or add in the chat. Does anybody have an idea how they might use this before they start a banking unit? Well, um, Harold, I think that you could get them to do the graphic organizer, the Venn diagram, mm -hmm. and then they can compare the two states. They can compare the population. They can compare um, like the employment rate and then the um, probably the education. Why do people not have it? And then the banks that are in the area too. And that could Absolutely. be a reason why they could come in and watch and think about what's the differences and the similarities. Absolutely, and Cynthia brings up a good good point. You have to be cautious because of the have nots and the, the haves. We compared rural to urban in this area. Um, and I like Thurman said inquiry-based assignment. So that's really good. So my and what, student- And, and what I'm, I'm sorry, what I meant by that is that sometimes I like to uh, allow students to analyze the data and create a inquiry question based on their observation and ask the question why a certain situation in, in data exists because I like to use a term called data storytelling because I believe behind every piece of data there is a story to be told. Absolutely, and that's a really good point. Um, and that's a good way to expand on it prior to a banking unit. This helps students and individuals see that across the country, there is differences, but also what can we do to change it or what is happening to change it? So that's another thing you can expand on. So what are, we're gonna go into banking now. What are the two primary pur purposes of banking? What are the two primary purposes? Mm 
Does anybody know? Savings and loans. Joyce, you are absolutely correct. Joyce is absolutely correct. It is, their primary purpose is to encourage savings and they provide a small interest rate on that. And then they loan that money out for an interest rate as well so that they can continue to also be able to make money and stimulate sales and buying and loans. So they wanna stimulate the economy as well, right? So that's absolutely the purpose. Now, my students, as we move forward, did not realize the magnitude. Yes, that's absolutely right. why, Erica, that um, there are some banks that absolutely you have to have a savings account. All right, now we can go into the community. How can we make this relevant for our students? Now, there are various dip different types of financial institutions, but we focus on the financial institutions that have a direct impact on them. That's community banks and credit unions and the Federal Reserve. And then we can dig a little deeper into that as we move forward, if time permits. So the difference between community banks versus the credit unions is here up on the slide. Credit unions is for the people and for profit, not for profit. The ownership is the the owners and like I tell my students I'm part of Navy Federal Credit Union my husband was a Marine it's democratically controlled by the members it's service driven in order to be able to stay functioning they have to have the members the return they return the profits to the members and that's federally insured by the NCUA. Now my students didn't understand the difference between the NCUA and the FDIC. So we have to break that down just a little bit further for that. Your regular community banks are for profit, obviously. The customers have no ownership. They're controlled by paid officials and they're profit driven. And the profits are not returned to the members, they're returned to the stockholders. And again, students, do not realize there's a difference between NCUA and FDIC. Um, so we do highlight the difference between the two and that NCUA, NCUA is strictly for credit unions where FDIC is for the community banks. All right, so we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into the banking basics and hopefully you can hear the audio on this. And if not, we will troubleshoot. So we have an ed puzzle we're going to do. All right, I'm gonna play it and y'all let me know if you cannot hear it. Oh, that might be too loud. Right now we can't hear anything. All right, let me pause it. Let me see if it's the way I shared. Is anybody a Zoom guru? Okay, let me try resharing it. Share computer with sound, here we go. All right, can y'all see my screen? Yeah, it looks like it's doing something. All right. Sweet old retired people, micro pigs on leashes. It's almost as if they're trying to distract us from something. Oh, you mean like how in 2016, Wells Fargo admitted to creating 3.5 million fake accounts for customers to collect extra fees and charged over 570,000 people for auto insurance they didn't need, resulting in over 20,000 customers going into default? And then there's the now infamous practices of Citibank, Lehman Brothers, AIG, and other Wall Street giants of bundling toxic junk assets and repackaging them as AAA super safe investments, which led to a near collapse of the international money system that ordinary people are still hurting from. And most Americans feel that big banks are rewarded rather than punished for risky and predatory behavior. Bank of America received tens of billions in bailout funds in 2009, only to turn around the very next year and pay 
35 billion in executive bonuses. Not surprisingly, our trust in these institutions is low. A recent Gallup poll showed that only 27% of Americans have confidence in banks. But this is not a new phenomenon. 14th century poet Dante placed moneylenders in the seventh circle of hell, below violent murderers and blasphemers. So, being suspicious of big banks is nothing new, but what can you do? You've gotta stash your cash somewhere. And who can get through life without ever taking a loan or using a credit card? Thankfully, you do have options. Alternatives to big banks have been around for a while, and if you haven't looked into them yet, it might be time. One good alternative is a local community bank. Their fees and charges can be lower than national chains, and you can be pretty sure they won't use your money for risky bets or Wall Street gambles. Instead, they tend to make investments in the immediate region, helping to develop projects and businesses that create jobs and improve spaces in your hometown. There are over 52,000 community bank locations nationwide, and you can find ones in your area by checking out the ICBA's website. Then there are all right, so all together, what are the two advantages of having an account at a local community bank versus a national? Go ahead and tell me which one to click. Denise. Yes, ma'am. This is Joyce. Um, I'm not sure about anyone else, but I'm unable to see the screen, so I can't tell what you're what I'm supposed to tell you to click. Can y'all see the screen? Can anybody else I, not see the I screen? I did not. I did not see the video either. I could hear it, but I couldn't see it. All right, so y'all could not see it at all? No, it, the it's screen gray. was gray. Correct. All right, hold on. Let me try to reshare in a different way. Maybe it's Thank the way you. I'm sharing it. Thank yes, ma'am. No, I'm sorry. And I am not a Zoom guru yet, so I'm so sorry. <laughs> no problem. All right, can anybody see it now? Yes. Okay. I think How we about now? See, we're still seeing the um the power. Okay, hold on. Hold on one second. Let's try it this way. I had it optimized for video, so it might have messed it up. There we go. Okay. So the benefits, since y'all did not see the video, and I'm so sorry. The benefits of community bank, they typically have lower fees, correct? Am I correct? All right. And the yes. Let's see, community banks typically give back and support the local community. And this is yes. opposed to national. That's All right, correct. and thank you for bringing that to my attention. I really appreciate it. All right, so we're gonna continue. Then there are banks that don't rely on physical locations. Online banks like Simple and Chime usually have lower fees, partly due to having no brick and mortar expenses. They also tend to have no account minimums, don't charge overdraft fees, and ATMs are fee free at tens of thousands of locations. Both local banks and online based banks still typically offer FDIC protection on up to $250,000 worth of deposits per person and account type. So for most people, they are just as secure as the big national chains. You could also choose. All right, so true or false, when you deposit your money at a community or online bank, your money is insured up to $250,000 by the FDIC. True or false? True. True. Yep. All right. You could also choose to ditch banks altogether and open up an account at a credit union. Credit unions allow you to make deposits and withdrawals, take out loans and credit cards, and enjoy most other services you might expect from a bank. But unlike banks, credit unions are all nonprofit entities. Any profits made by the credit union are returned to you in the form of reduced fees, higher savings rates, and better loan terms. This is because credit unions technically don't have customers. They have members. Everyone who keeps their money at a credit union is seen as a part owner of the institution. And and they usually all share a common bond. Perhaps they all live in a particular geographic location, work in the same industry, or are all alumni of the same university. One member's deposits end up becoming an auto or business loan for another member. Teamwork. Credit unions offer FDIC-like protection through the NCUSIF, and most credit unions are part of a national shared branch network, which allows you to utilize thousands of other credit unions, just like they were your own. So depending on your credit union, you could have access to even more ATMs and branches than with a big national bank. Maybe. All right, what qualifications must you meet 
to be a member of a credit union. The second answer. Yes, ma'am. Maybe this all sounds great to you and you're ready to say sayonara to your big bank, but there are a few drawbacks to consider before making the switch. Because of their size and scope, big banks are better at international banking and lending. Making a withdrawal from abroad or getting a loan in another country can be a tall order for many local banks and credit unions. So if you do a lot of traveling or have a cross-border business, sticking with your big bank might make your life easier. Also, smaller banks and credit unions usually can't compete with the big banks' digital offerings. So if things like banking apps, budgeting software, and online accounting tools are important to you, be sure to inquire about the technological support they offer. Even though these advantages come from big banks' huge size, in their ads, they often go out of their way to portray themselves as homey, familiar, even rustic. It's as if they're saying little organizations are more trustworthy. So if you find these commercials persuasive, maybe you should check out the smaller organizations in your neighborhood. And, and that's, that's our two cents. All right, what questions should you ask before opening an account at a national bank, community bank, or credit union? Choose all the ones that apply. So who wants to let me know the answer? All of them. All of the this above. All of them. Yes. All of them. You are absolutely correct. Now, my students, after they've watched this, they did not realize all the questions they should be asking in regards to banking. So it was really interesting to get their feedback on what they thought about that and how it affects them and the questions. All right, I'm gonna reshare the PowerPoint. I hope, all right. All right, so the role of the FDIC. We know it was created by Congress. The purpose to, is to remain, maintain stability and the public confidence and it ensures up to $250,000. Now, as my students are preparing for the WISE test, they're getting confused between the FDIC and the SEC. So we, I include this in there to show that the SEC, the St Security Exchange Commission, is to protect investors. It has to do with investing. And also it maintains a fair and effective market. And of course it facilitates capital formation. So I always highlight the difference between the two and how they, um, how they apply to them and the purpose that, that we are going towards. So the FDIC is what they're looking for in regards to banking. All right, the Federal Reserve, we're gonna do a quick highlight about that. It's the central bank in the United States. It's privately owned. Um, we know its purpose and it's composed of 12 different banks. And I have another Ed puzzle, puzzle that I am going to share. And this time I'm gonna share my screen better, I promise. Do we have any questions or comments before I start it? Not yet? Okay. All right, and this is just a quick four minute video to break down the Federal Reserve, what we call Barney style in my classroom. Money, you put it in the bank, and it's there when you want it. But what if you went to the ATM and the bank didn't have your cash? It happened in the past. And that's why the Federal Reserve was created, to keep the financial system stable. The Fed provides short-term loans to banks so they have enough money on hand in times of financial stress. But travel back in time to before 1913. No one was responsible for the health of our banking system. There was no lender of last resort. Why? Because from our country's earliest history, some people opposed a central bank. They feared it would put too much power in too few hands. But as the country grew, frequent banking panics kept the economy on a roller coaster ride. 
complete with ups and downs, chills and spills. The last straw came in 1907. One of Wall Street's largest financial institutions, the Knickerbocker Trust Company, went bankrupt. Panic was widespread. People raced to withdraw their savings, only to find that banks didn't have cash available. Financier J.P. Morgan and a group of investors rescued the economy with emergency loans to banks. But it was clear that relying on wealthy individuals wasn't the right long-term solution for the nation. It was time. All right, what year did the Knickerbocker Trust panic happen? 1907. Yep. Time for a change. The United States needed a strong central bank that would keep money flowing during times of crisis and help prevent bank runs. And then here, this is just a quick, what is a bank run? Um, and it's when everyone attempts to get all their money out. And we usually expand on it, attempts to get all the money from the bank when um, they're in fear of losing it. To keep power from being concentrated in Washington or Wall Street, lawmakers spread control across the country. The Federal Reserve Act of 1913 established 12 independent reserve banks, in addition to a board of governors in Washington. The structure would insulate the Fed from partisan politics and powerful financial interests. All right, and what year was it enacted? And I'll go ahead and for time's sake, it's 1913. Over time, the Fed learned how the supply of money and credit affects financial markets and the economy. By the 1950s, the Fed was working to counter the ups and downs of booms and busts and limit inflation. In the late 70s, a new crisis hit. Bad news on the inflation front. Wholesale prices were up again in February. High unemployment with high inflation challenged America and the Fed. Oil price hikes and poor policy choices made the situation worse. In 1979, Paul Volcker was appointed Fed chairman. Volcker and the Federal Open Market Committee put the brakes on inflation. They reduced the growth of the money supply and raised interest rates. Once inflation was back in check, the economy started growing again and unemployment fell. Breaking news here, stocks all around the world are tanking. More than half a million Americans lost their jobs last month. That is the worst month for job losses. More recently, in 2008, the Fed responded to the largest financial crisis since the Great Depression. Many major financial institutions were on the verge of collapse. Unemployment skyrocketed. The Federal Reserve is more than happy to try the to work with The Fed made emergency loans to stabilize the financial system and then purchased bonds to lower interest rates and help stimulate the economy. Though the Fed wasn't able to prevent what has been called the Great Recession, its actions helped keep the situation from being much worse. Beyond financial crises, there will always be unforeseen events and natural disasters. The Fed can do a lot to cushion their economic impact and keep money flowing. So the next time you reach into your wallet or drop by an ATM, take a look at one of the bills and find the words Federal Reserve Note. And remember, the Fed's goal is to help keep the economy healthy. And then we're going to skip that one for just time's sake. And please let me warn you about the rabbit hole that I almost fell down on this one. My students now are very curious to how the Fed Reserve is reacting to COVID. Um, so please be very careful about that rabbit hole. We are planning a project on it, 
but we're not quite there yet. So I wanna warn you about that caveat. So here my students learn about where the 12 Federal Reserves are, and we discuss why they are located where they're at in regard to the ge geographical area and population. All right, and then we're gonna get to a comic strip. How much, oops, there's a typo. The is is supposed to be gone. How much does the penny save cost you? Well, a penny saved is still a penny earned, minus user fees, transactions, and charges. Can anybody else think of a financial quote or idiom that would fall within this realm? Can anybody think of one? Nobody can think of a financial idiom. We have a penny saved as a penny earned. Um, save for a rainy day, absolutely. So that's a good one. So if you're saving for a rainy day and you're having to pay fees and transaction charges on that, right? Or if you're saving it in your mattress, you're not earning any interest. So I have the students check, look up various different idioms and they can make their own meme out of it. And that's just uh, to show mastery. And here's another one right here. More bang for your buck. I like that one, Joyce. Can you expand on how that could be made into a meme or into a cartoon? Could that fall under investing or even just the type of savings account that you choose? <laughs> All right, that sounds good. I'll put you on the spot. I'm sorry. Spending, absolutely. All right, and here's another one, and this has to do with the Federal Reserve. JP Morgan said gold and silver are money, everything else is credit. Many of our students do not realize that our money is fiat money that is not backed by gold and silver. It's only backed by the government's word. Ooh, I like penny wise and a pound foolish. I like that. That's a really good one. I haven't thought of that one in a long time. So here's one that discusses the Federal Reserve. We're, dis we're considering whether or not to prop him up. And again, this comic strip took us down another rabbit hole in regards to what happened with COVID. So if you're willing to go down that rabbit hole, go for it. I'm not quite there yet. All right. And then I want to show y'all some fun resources for y'all. Um, how many of y'all have students that are heavy into football? How many of y'all have football heavy students that love football? Anybody? We don't have a lot of athletes. Oh, my high school students love football here. They do. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you this football game. And then I have one that is more friendly for the females. So let me get to there and share my screen. Let me reshare. All right, y'all. For my sports lovers, and this is application based. Visa and NFL football. So you go to play now, and you tell them to go to play online. And you, as a teacher, if you need lessons or resources, they're right here. So you're absolutely able to use them. I had, I had forgotten about financial football. My kids love it. Right. It is such a fun resource. Mm -hmm. um, if I could get my screen to go down. It's not wanting to go down for some reason. There we go. All right. It is loading. Has anybody else used financial football? Edward says used it. Um, is that you, Miss Tammy, that said you used it? Yes. All right. So if you have not used financial football, 
will make financial decisions in order to advance themselves and to be able to select plays as soon as it loads. It's taking a minute. You can't hear? Is that better? Much better. Okay. So I'm going to pick heads and I'll show you the other one as well. So I'm going to pick heads and then I'm going to kick. And I don't know why I always kick. So as you see here, you get to pick easy, you get to do a blitz, which is medium, and you can do hard. I'm gonna do an easy one just because, and it gives you categories. Networking is one type of professional development. True. Now, if they get the question right, they get to complete the play. If they don't, it tells them why it's wrong and they have to try again. So that is financial football. There are banking questions available. Um, it just gives them the opportunity to practice what they're learning in class, both new and old material. And this one is a payoff game. So when you talk about loans and lending in regards to the banking system, this is a payoff game and it's more like a social media aspect from what, um, from the feel that I get. And let me get that up for us and share my screen without the sound so that I don't cause y'all to go deaf. And I'm sorry about that, y'all. All right, so you end up becoming one of these characters. And then you can register or you can just do solo. No sound. Denise, is this one that we're supposed to be able to hear? Um, what it talks about is the goal between them. Um, what it is, is they are attempting to become a video. Um, they're trying to win like a video um, competition. So they end up having to read banking statements. They have to look at financial statements. So that goes along with banking. And they also hit unexpected financial pitfalls. So what happens is they have to decide what are they going to do during these pitfalls? Are they going to go to a payday loan? Are they going to go to their bank? So they have to make these decisions in order to be successful in the final um, goal. And you end up becoming one of the two personalities. 
so those are two games currently that um, my students are playing around with. And then here are some resources. If you have not been through ngpf.org, they have a great lesson on choosing your savings and checking account. And my students absolutely love it. And I think Tammy uses it as well. We have eco, eco I can never say this word, ecom link. Um, and they have some great videos and lessons that you can sign as well in, to support the banking and the savings and checking. And then we have the, um, the Federal Reserve of Atlanta. So they have some great resources as well to support this lesson. And as I tell my students, unbanked and underbanked individuals, the biggest issues they have are they do not have emergency funds. So when COVID hit, a lot of them did not have emergency funds. They did not have access to credit. And the, just the time cost. Because if you're unbanked or underbanked, in order to try to prevent these fees, you are going from place to place paying your bills. Because you don't want to spend that $40,000 in fees. So do we have any questions or concerns or anything you would like to add to it? Hi, Denise, this is Joyce. Can you go back to the slide where you were showing us the map of the 12 Federal Reserve Banks? Yes, ma'am, I would be more than happy to. All right, can you see it? Yes, thank you. Yes, ma'am. And we talk about the population and the geographical areas. Why were they chosen? And they do have to do a little bit research and thinking into this. And the most common question I get now is why don't we move them? Because population has changed since then. And that's a great question. It's one I have not figured out yet. Denise, this is Joyce again. I also think that that's a great question because I think that with, you know, we always hear in the news that Charlotte, North Carolina is one of the largest banking um, centers in the country. So you would think that, you know, if they redid this, that Charlotte would be on the map. However, I do realize that, you know, uh, the Federal Reserve does um, have a location in Charlotte, although it's not on the bank. Mm -hmm. on the so you're correct. Um, now, Cynthia brings up a good point as well that you can do Thurman's inquiry based talking about where would they suggest we put them today? So Cynthia, that is a great tie in to Thurman's earlier inquiry based and just expanding on this. So they would have to know the population, they would have to research the geographical area. They may even want to research what the unbanked population is and why. Exactly. So this is a great expansion idea on this. Thank you, Cynthia, for that. That really, that I'm going to have to steal that idea. I hope you don't mind. So again, um, you know, students don't understand what that bank is. And I can tell you about 25% of my current students, just from polling them, parents are unbanked. So for them, for us to educate them and then for them to take it home is important because that helps them gain the knowledge they need so that they can be more confident and comfortable in putting their money in banking accounts so that they can have that emergency fund access to credit and their time value. Do we have any more questions, comments, concerns? All right, I'm gonna move on to the South Carolina Financial Literacy Master Teacher Program. 
I am currently in silver year. Do we have any other master financial literacy teachers in here? Um, we don't have any? I am. This is Tammy. I am. <laughs> yes. And this is Andrea. I'm one as well. All right. What year are y'all in? Thurman. We're, we're second we're on, year? I'm second year as well. Uh -huh. Awesome. We have a couple in the comments as well. Um, Smoot is year one. Mary and Mary says that Thurman Evans and her are both. Uh, and Patty Nunnally. As well. I love it. Y'all, this is so much worth the journey. It really is. Um, and I encourage y'all, if you're not part of it, not only do you, you know, get some financial incentive for it, um, but it really does give you access to a lot of professional development and just a lot of meeting a lot of great people and experiences. Would you all agree on that? Yes, I do. Absolutely. Yes. All right. So as you all know, 10 teachers will receive at a hundred bucks. Um, y'all will be receiving the link. Um, are you going to put the link in the chat or do you want me to? Yeah, I'll put the link in the chat. Thank you. All right. So um, you'll be able to put this, apply for the hundred dollars. They will ask for evidence. So screenshots will be fine. Um, samples of student work. And if you want to protect their security of their name, you can block out their name from my understanding. Oh, actually, Denise, if you could put that one in there, I have the, um, the link to the evaluation after this. this okay. Uh, All right, let me get this one. Oops, wrong screen. All right. All right, and this is in the document, and I'm going to share this PowerPoint presentation with Amanda and Chandler and ask her to send it out to y'all so y'all have access to all the hyperlinks and the Ed Puzzles. If you want to use any of it, you are more than welcome to. And then here are the requirements um, for those of y'all that are interested in um, doing the $100. So you participate in the workshop, check. Basic contact information. Make sure your address is complete and correct, please. Complete the short evaluation of the workshop today. Um, and you can absolutely tell them she knows nothing about Zoom. <laughs> so, okay. I'm a Teams, I, I am a Microsoft Teams district. Um, you have to teach a financial literacy lesson to your students. And you'll show it in your reflection, just a short description, learning targets, and then you're going to upload the samples. And you all, I appreciate you being so patient with me with my Zoom issues um, and also being slightly nervous. I'm not going to lie, this is my first statewide PD. Um, I usually keep it local. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate y'all. So well, do we have... Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say thank you so much, Denise. Um, I have a couple more things to add. I was just going to say we really appreciate you being here and we loved your presentation and you did great. No reason to be nervous, but um, so just want to thank everybody who attended. Um, we fully recognize the important role that you play in educating our South Carolinians, but uh, we want to make sure that you get your incentives. So if you could complete this evaluation link that I was going to put in the chat. Um, I'll send that right now. But uh, if you, if teachers attend five or more SE Economics hosted webinars this fall and complete each evaluation, uh, you'll be as eligible for a $100 incentive. And uh, I hope you all have a good night. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. And y'all, my um, email is in there. Yes, we'll make sure you get everything. Um, so S Cynthia is going to need the evaluation link in her email. Um, yeah, Cynthia, do you mind sticking your um, your email address in the chat box real quick? And I'll send that over to you. So y'all, my email is on the presentation y'all will receive. If y'all want, I have a ton of, I am the project queen and I am a Nearpod queen. So if you all need any resources whatsoever. Um, 
I probably have you covered. So if you need any ideas, I'd love to collaborate. Thurman, I'm stealing your idea. Cynthia, I'm stealing some of yours as well. Um, so I hope you don't mind. But again, if y'all need anything or need an idea, um, I'm more than happy to collaborate. And I really appreciate y'all tonight and I appreciate y'all um, adding value and giving me some ideas as well. Thank y'all so much for the sweet words. And y'all need to make sure I know about y'all's PDs so I can join them. Okay, um, Erica and Cynthia, I'm sending that link to y'all now. Uh, and if anybody else needs it, you can put your email in the chat and I'll make sure to send it your way. Thank you, Miss Patty. I appreciate y'all so much. All right, well, if nobody else has any questions, I'm gonna go ahead and close it down, but um, feel free to add anything else to the chat that you might need. I'll keep it open for a couple more minutes, just in case. And thank you so much for your help today. I really appreciate you. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. You did a great job. Thanks. I was a tad bit nervous. I'm not gonna lie, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and I had Zoom issues. Ugh. <laughs> if it was teams i would have had y'all now <laughs> while the thing was happening with the zoom i was trying to look up how to how to add the screen and how to add sound to it just in case but i couldn't figure it out either and miss tammy if you need anything for fundamentals of computing please let me know i have a lot of it fundamental projects if you need any okay i certainly will thank you so much you did a great job thank you so much but again i'm happy to share whatever i have with y'all okay same here. And I have a bunch of entrepreneurship stuff as well, if anybody needs it. I'm just saying. Okay. I like hoard material. I'm, I'm bad about that too. <laughs> I have so many thumb drives, it's not even funny. <laughs> Better to have too much than too little. I agree. I agree. However, it has helped out a lot this year. Yes. It really has. Yeah. Is anybody else doing the WISE test this year? Nobody? I'm not giving it to students, no. Am I the only um, one that has lost her mind to try it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> and they're even, I, I teach middle school this year. They're going to let me do it with middle school. Oh, wow. I think they think I'm nuts. Oh, my gosh. Yes, I think I have lost my mind this year, but we're going to try. We're going to try. And this is probably the year that I should try it because in the 14 years I've taught, been teaching business, I'm also certified in English, nice. but um, in the 14 years I've taught personal finance, this is probably the best class I've had just because they get it, they understand the importance of it. Mm -hmm. And I have several students that are constantly asking me questions because they have bank checking their own bank accounts and everything. Yeah. And I, it has really been, this is probably the year I should do it. It really is because I don't know if I'll get this lucky again. <laughs> Last year was a really defining moment for me because I had, I worked at alternative school last year. Oh gosh. And my students actually went home and taught their own parents what they were that's, learning. That's awesome. And they, I had one student, he was like, I need to teach my mom this because I'm paying the light bill. I'm like, my heart broke. Oh. But he literally went home and tried to show his mom how to budget and how to pay bills. And I honestly think she was underbanked. And probably was because she probably had never been taught. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I graduated from high school in 87. We didn't have personal finance, but we had a class back then that was called um, business math. Yeah. And my mother made me take it. And I loved it. And that's one of the reasons I, that and account, high school accounting are the two reasons that I'm a business ed teacher. It's because I, oh, I, I love I, those two classes. I love that our district picked up personal finance and um, 
this is the first year all middle schools are teaching it. Well, I really wish we could, as a stake, could get it as a graduation requirement. Because I agree. The issue is they want to know what's going to replace it. Like, what? where's that? You know, yeah. What are you going to take away? So I agree with you 100%. It really does need to be a graduation requirement. I think even above technology, and I, I'm, I teach the See, technology I'm, requirement. I'm, I'm there right there with you. To me, if we're going to teach the kids a computer class, we need to be teaching them Google Apps or IBA. Yeah, computer they're gonna applications. Use. Yes, yep. we do not need to be teaching them this coding class because it's to me, it's just not... If they're going to be do computer programming, they're going to they can take it at our career center or in college if that's what they're interested in. But I just don't agree with this them changing the requirement. I understand completely, but I like that personal finance is starting to catch on. I do too. I do too. This is the first time we've had three sections of it in several years. So nice. yeah, I've got two sections and another teacher has one, so. Well, I'm excited and I'm so happy I made the connections with y'all that I did. I am too, yes. This is so, great. I love this program. So do I, it's really good. <laughs> well, Miss Tammy, I loved our connection today and please keep in touch. I will, I will. I would love to do some collaboration with you. Okay. Um, and thank you so much for everything and for helping me host today. <laughs> uh, where'd she go? She left me. She's, she's there. <laughs> I'm like, where'd she go? She left me. She's there. <laughs> um, so, and I know y'all are ready to go and um, maybe rest up because hopefully tomorrow life will be a little bit less political for us. It won't be. Luckily but, for us, tomorrow's a virtual day. We have virtual days on Wednesdays. Thank goodness. Nice. Which yeah. I absolutely love. We, we have virtual days be, on Friday. Oh, I like the Wednesdays because it gives us a time in the middle of the week to kind of take yeah. a breath. And even our administration really wishes they wouldn't get rid of it because they, it, it's good. Did for you them just too. do the South Carolina State? Uh, there was a, a form that went out asking about how, teacher retention, and that was one of them. Hmm to include a virtual day because we do Friday's half day virtual. Our Wednesday and then, full day virtual, which is so, it really is nice and not you can get caught up on grading. You can, we, and yep. they tell us to hold our meetings. I have my meeting link, yep. I have it up, I have it open. The kids know they can come ask questions. I yeah, mean, we do the same thing. it's great, I love it, but I'm afraid that five days face to face when we go back, we're going to lose that day. And I think that's, that's going to hurt teacher retention. I really do I think, think so. That. I think you're it right. Will. All right. Well, I know that you all are ready to go to bed <laughs> um, and get ready to face tomorrow. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for everybody that showed up. And Miss Tammy, I'd love to keep in contact with you. Okay. That's and Miss Cynthia, if you're still in here and, um, Mr. Thurman, I'd love to keep in contact with y'all as well. And Miss Tammy. So you all have a wonderful evening. You too. Well, thank you again, Denise. Thank you. And I really appreciate all your help today. Yeah, of course. Have a good night. Good night. Uh, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.